Now, let's meet our gang today. First of all, I'll start off with our performers. Uh, Mary J has been playing second trumpet with the HPO for over 30 years. Wow. And she also plays with the Stratford Festival Orchestra and is a regular extra with the Kitchener Waterloo Symphony and is a valued member of our really well loved HPO brass quintet. And Mary is married to Larry Larson, who is principal trumpet of the Kitchener Waterloo Symphony, has been there since 1993, and before that was with the HPO as principal trumpet. And uh, Larry is no stranger to Canadian music. He has performed a number of Canadian trumpet concertos by composers like Scott Good, John Astacio, uh, Malcolm Forsyth, Murray Schaefer. So uh, it's great to have you both here with us. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Uh, now, how much do you two get to play together? I would say we get to play together when we are playing the same jobs together. So I play a lot of extra trumpet with the Kitchener Symphony. Um, and we've done a number of shows together at the Stratford Festival. We play a lot together that way. At home, before COVID, I would say we don't play together <laughs> at all because we're just, uh, you know, you you run out of energy at the end of end of the day, right? And, so we, and so go ahead. We've done a lot of projects together, a lot of you know online recordings, and just just playing duets in general. So it's uh, it's been really, you know, in that regard, it's been very fun. Yeah. Oh, isn't that isn't that great? Um, and can I ask, how did you two meet? Uh, <laughs> uh, what was it? it? Was about thirty two years ago. Boris Brot had a Pops Orchestra that performed at Ontario Place. And we were both uh, hired to do that job. And there was a little duet by pan flutist Zamfir. And uh, that duet was just magical. And so we kind of looked at each other and started dating. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, isn't that perfect? So you met through a duet and, and here you have a duet written just for you. So, wow. Couldn't, couldn't be better. <laughs> All right, now I would like to introduce composer David Yeager. Welcome, David. Hello. And, yes, hello. Uh, David is uh, not only a composer, but also a producer and has actually produced a concert for us already at the HPO this season. Right. And uh, David was a longtime producer for the legendary and treasured uh, new music program on CBC called Two New Hours. And through that program, commissioned about 250 pieces. Wow. And uh, also was a delegate to the International rostrum of composers and oversaw the CBC uh, Young Composers competition, among other things. So we, we owe him a great debt uh, for his incredible contribution to our Canadian music scene. And he was, uh, he was given uh, a member of the Order of Canada. Um, and uh, that's an, an incredible achievement. Um, I'd also like to, to point out that David also writes for Whole Note magazine and wrote a very interesting article um, w uh, when he found out that he uh, received the Order of Canada. And, it, and this article is great too, because it, uh, it details some of his contributions to the scene over the years. So we'll, we'll post that link. So David, it's, it's great to uh, have you with us here. Um, now, can you tell us, uh, we're going to hear a, a world premiere, as I mentioned, for, for Mary and Larry. Can you tell us how this piece came to be? Well, uh, thank you, Abby. It's, a, it's really great to be here and uh, quite a privilege to have this occasion to, to have this premiere. Um, you know, my, my work at the CBC was some 40 years, if you can believe. I... Um, I finished my uh, composition study at University of Toronto and almost immediately was fortunate to, to become a staff member at CBC Radio Music. Um, as you can imagine, being a busy producer for all those years meant that my composing life sort of took a back seat, I guess. Mm -hmm. And um, so I guess I put my energy into helping other composers uh, and, uh, well, we could talk about that uh, at some point later. But um, so after those 40 years, when I, when I finished up in uh, 2013, I wanted to make up for, uh, for lost time, as it were. 
And uh, I started writing pieces for all those great musicians that I had met in the course of, of my pr producing career. Mm. Uh, Larry Larson being not the least of them. Right. Um, and I must say that I had this idea that I really wanted to work on my melodic composition. I wanted to uh, improve. I wanted to refine and develop my writing for just melody. So these, all these people with, uh, with melodic instruments like trumpets and flutes and, and clarinets and, uh, you know, the string instruments and, and, and singers, for example, I started writing uh, a lot of solo pieces for them. Um, I'll just show this. This is Christina Haldane, the soprano, uh, who released this recording. Uh, let me explain just what I'm doing. Uh, her father is a, is a fabulous internationally recognized poet. And um, I decided I wanted to set some of his poems for her to sing as unaccompanied melodies. But the, on the way to doing this, I decided I would test those melodies in instrumental voices, just so that I could hear them just without the words, just so that I could be clear about how the, mel the melodies were structured. So I came up with this idea uh, without words. And uh, I started creating pieces out of these melodies. Trumpet was, was one of the first instruments I, I thought of. And of course, Larry, I had known uh, after many, many occasions, recording him with, uh, with the Kitchener Orchestra and uh, various other uh, uh, opportunities to hear his unbelievably fine trumpet playing. So, uh, you know, it wasn't very long before I thought, well, I'll just send these over to Larry. And he was immediately receptive. And he, he you know, Larry's a, a very, uh, a very highly motivated guy. He has a, his own recording set up at home, beautiful studio with really high quality mics. And he immediately turned around and recorded these, these pieces for me. And uh, much to my pleasure, this is about 20, 2017. So in the meantime, you know, the world has changed. And uh, I discovered your series, Get to Know the HPO. In the yeah, it, it was great to have you watching along, David, and, and commenting. We all loved it. Well, so there was Mary J. Now, I knew Larry really well. I had no idea he was married to a trumpeter. I, I, I didn't have the, you know, the inside family information. So here I was enjoying your webcast, uh, you know, a few months back and, and marveling at what a, what a great player she was. And then suddenly Larry appeared as part of that webcast. And so, oh, they are a couple. And I, at that very moment, I had the idea, well, look, if you've created a good melody, if you've created a melody that you feel is, is standing on its own legs, as it were, all it takes is a counterpoint and you've got a duet. So uh, I, I wrote to Larry uh, instantly after that webcast ended and said, you know, I think I've got some duos I'm going to cook up for you. Would you be interested? Well, the answer was, was clear and was immediate. So I took three of these without words pieces and added counterpoints to them. So we have, we have uh, a lot of imitation. So sharing of the, of the material, sharing of the lines, and you're kind of back and forth as, as is uh, traditional in, in, a, in a duet setting, which mm -hmm. you'll hear. Mm -hmm. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Uh, it's, uh, it's really lovely for, for us at the HPO as well to have this come out of, um, you know, this sort of pandemic Facebook show we created. So, uh, so that's really wonderful. It was um, a think of it as a creative opportunity. There we are. There we are. <laughs> Um, and uh, that, that session with uh, Get to Know Mary J uh, was really fun, and uh, we'll post that as well, so um, people can look at it again. And 
uh, Mary and Larry did a really fun musical quiz, <laughs> which which hasn't been done since. It was a, a really, a really great. Uh, so Larry, uh, was this a, a total surprise then? I, I guess so. Yeah, it, it absolutely was. Uh, I remember when the, when the the message came in from David on, on Facebook and uh, I was so excited because I, like, like he said, I, I had just set up a home recording studio, uh, you know, far well before pandemic times. And I thought, well, what a, what a perfect way to test out my setup. So I immediately fired off. There were four originally for solo trumpets. And I, I immediately fired them off and sent them back to David. And, and we went back and forth a little bit with a couple of tweaks. And uh, yeah, I was, I was very, very happy to, to receive them. And it was a, a real thrill to collaborate with David. I, I had never collaborated with him as a composer before. Uh, you know, I was, I had known him for, well, gosh, how many years, over, over 20 years um, as his, his legendary role at CBC. Uh, the first time we met face to face, I had done Murray Schaefer's Concerto of the Falcon's Trumpet for uh, a recording with the Kitchener Waterloo Symphony. And uh, when I was done with my performance, I went back to the truck and walking there to, to see if I could have a, a listen. And and uh, he turns to me and says, hi, I'm David Yeager. And I just about stopped in my tracks because I had never met David before. And here I was sitting next to him listening to the, the broadcast of my performance. So, and, but, and we've kept in touch over the years since then. And it was just so when I actually got to hear some of his compositions and specifically for solo trumpet, it was an absolute thrill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wonderful. Um, we have some uh, some follow up comments here about uh, well uh, about a number of things here. First of all, uh, Laura Larson uh, writes in response to your meeting, "I'm howling. That's perfect." <laughs> <laughs> I think we know Laura. Yeah, she, her name's popped up somewhere uh, in our history. Last name Larson. <laughs> um, and then uh, Matthias McIntyre, who's one of our composer fellows, who we will hear from uh, shortly, says, uh, you know, fantastic in regards to the story of, of the uh, duets. And uh, Craig Fisk writes a good story on the background of uh, to the trumpet piece at various levels. And, and another thing is we just learned that it's your birthday today, Larry. <laughs> oh, wow. Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that great? All right. Um, now, a uh, question for all of you. How was it collaborating on this new piece, uh, you know, during a pandemic when you can't get together? Well, Larry and I can get together. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously, there's been different levels of how much we've had to stay home. So, we're doers in this family. And so these pieces came in and I said to Larry immediately, okay, we've got to record them for mm -hmm. David. We've got to record them. So initially um, we sat down pretty immediately after yeah. we got them and we recorded them and fired them off to David. It was a nice challenge for us because that was when we first started working on our home recording. Mm -hmm. um, and this was like end of May, correct? I believe. I think so. And uh, so we were thrilled just to have something to dig our teeth into and put out to him. You know, it was really fun to do and just to explore what he's done with the two levels of this composition. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Larry, I understand that you have also recorded the solo version, right? That we can hear. So we're going to post uh, this and I, I believe we can find this on your YouTube page, correct? I did, yeah. In fact, uh, these are the recordings that I did back in May of 2018 when David first presented them to me. So uh, since it was early on, I was able to actually go back to those recordings and tweak the sound a little bit now Now that I know what I'm doing after, after <laughs> three years of, of home studio recordings. So uh, yes, I, I, I actually put this video together last night. It's just the audio, but I, you can follow along with the music on, on my YouTube page as you're listening. So that's to give you an idea of what he's written and uh, the challenges for the instrument. But they're, they're, they're lovely. I just, I, again, you know, I'll, I'll repeat, I had such a great time playing through these when he first presented them to me. And it's, so it's great that we'll have, this is a world premiere per performance of these as well. 
Mm -hmm. Well, we'll we'll hear it shortly. But before we do, I have a question submitted by our HPO uh, composer fellow by one of them. So we do have a mentorship program here at the HPO, um, which is very, very important to us. Uh, we have uh, two composer fellows with us every year. Um, and uh, they have a performance uh, on, on stage, but they also participate in, uh, you know, community events and um, here they're asking questions and I know they're following along as well. Um, and we also, by the way, have uh, two HPO Future Award winners. They are Sophie Dupuis and Nathalie Jacques, and they'll be having readings with us and are doing professional mentorship. So we are, are, are trying to do our part. So here is a question from uh, one of our composer fellows, Ari Verhul van de Ven. He writes to David, uh, personally, I find duets to be one of the most difficult ensemble sizes to manage. How do you approach writing for two of the same instruments and what kind of sounds interest you in this combination? Great question. Thank you for, for that. You know, the thing is, so first of all, I, uh, I already mentioned that I had been writing these uh, unaccompanied melodies and uh, uh, I realized actually it was, you know, seeing that webcast get to know the HBO with Mary J I realized well you know there's couples and as much as there might be a market for solo pieces there's probably couples that could use uh, some duets so so to come to your question specifically I mean I think the idea is that uh, you use imitation you as I said earlier, once you have a, a melody that you're convinced holds up, is strong and is convincing, uh, the next thing to do is to write a counterpoint. So you use imitation, you use the, the motifs, the material, it, pass it back and forth. Uh, and of course, if you're writing for trumpets, there's some wonderful acoustic resultants that happen, especially when they're playing in close harmony. Uh, and you'll hear this, this kind of, uh, acoustical effect. Uh, it's just thrilling. Uh, it's the, the hallmark of, of writing, uh, you know, for multiple trumpets. It's this, uh, it's hard to describe. It's a, it's, it's a, a resultant frequencies that, that come from the interaction between the, the two tones. And um, so, uh, you know, I think you try to take advantage of that. You try to, uh, 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 balance the two parts carefully together so that the material is, is shown uh, in both parts, you know, uh, in a balanced kind of way, and that the whole thing adds up to something that's greater than the sum of the parts, shall we say. I hope that answers the question. I, I think it does. I think it does. Now, David, uh, we're going to hear this piece in just a moment. And I have a question for all of you. Is there anything you would like to tell our audience about the piece before we hear it? Anything to listen for? Well, I guess I would just add that when we submitted the video uh, and David saw it, uh, I mistakenly switched up two of the movements in the order. Yeah. So, but upon hearing that, David was thrilled. <laughs> said keep it so uh yeah, yeah. no I, I think originally it had been a traditional fast slow fast uh arrangement of, of pieces but the thing is the the piece that had formerly been in the middle is now the the, the concluding uh movement actually ends with such a beautiful flourish <laughs> you know if i may say uh that I'm completely satisfied that it, it works beautifully that way as as well. So, um, yeah, enjoy. Uh, uh, it's in three three movements, as I guess uh, you might have divined, and uh, they are contrasting in terms of mood and tempo and and so on, and and uh, the devices that are used uh, between the parts. Fabulous. Well, well, let's hear it. This is the world premiere of Without Words for Two Trumpets, written by David Yeager and performed by Mary J and Larry Larson. <laughs> Thank you. 
Congratulations. That was fantastic. Wow, that was great. It was Thank great. you, guys. Thank you, David. Thank you. And I, I must add that, you know, as a composer writing for artists of this caliber, where you, you, you know, there's, you can write anything, they'll play it. And, and you know, to be able to, the, the, the confidence that gives a composer uh, is, is, a, is a wonderful, positive experience. And, uh, you know, that intonation, those octaves perfectly in tune, all the intervals just, and perfectly balanced, uh, it's wonderful, just, it's a thrill. Well, as Mary said earlier, we've been playing together for 32 years now, so I think I think we're finally getting the hang of it. <laughs> I would say so. <laughs> yeah. So um, I I really appreciated that uh, the the lines. It seemed like they're just so intertwined, almost like it's a vine. Um, yeah. And and uh, another thing is, it seems to me like it's it's one theme, but that we almost now look at it in a three dimensional way, almost like looking at it from different angles and slightly different uh, time shifts. Uh, right. I found it I found it really wonderful. Uh, Thank you. Thank and, you. And uh, Mary and Larry, such such tremendous partnership and and balance and and tone. So thank you for that. It's, it's fun listening back again. Is it, it's you know it's, it's often hard to tell who's playing what line, and that's that's what's really fun. And again, that that just goes to the fact that we've played together for so long. It's you know. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, now I have a couple of comments to share. Um, first of all. Michael Fedition, our friend Michael Fedition, who is a principal trumpet of the HPO, says, first of all, yes, Mare and Lair, two of my faves. And then after hearing the work, uh, says, uh, lovely work, all three of you. Uh, Erica Yeager comments, just beautiful. My heart is full. Sophie Dupuy, who is uh, one of our HPO Future Award winners, says, wonderful performance. Chia Yin Wu says, what a beautiful piece and performance. And Daryl Doxtater comments, ah, the singing of trumpets, a wonderful sound that I miss. Looking forward to the end of COVID and the return to the enjoyment of, of life. Um, now, uh, one question for you here, uh, Mary and Larry from Laura, Laura Larson asks, what is the most fulfilling aspect of playing together? For me, as I've often said, I, you do your best work when you're playing with top-notch players. And so it's always a little bit of, for me, I always feel it's a little bit of a challenge to be good enough to play with Larry. And... Uh, <laughs> Mary, Mary is selling herself short 100% here because, uh, you know, but as I always said that playing with all the people that are good players around me, including Mike and including Phil and Steve and Larry, uh, it's just always a challenge to keep my level up when I play with these people and especially to Larry. He's my, he's my mentor. Oh. <laughs> oh, you two are adorable. <laughs> Um, another another comment here. Uh, Barbara Wright comments, wonderful music. Uh, watching, listening from Colorado. Love your music without words, David. Um, now, uh, thank, you. thank you, Barbara. Mary and, and Larry, can you tell us a bit about your experience in making this video? Have you become experts at uh, home video performance and recording? We have uh, improved hugely. The very first thing we did was a fanfare really early on, like in March for the Stratford Festival. And so we sat on the piano bench uh, with light to our back, which you're not supposed to do. Uh, no hair, no makeup. It was, and when I saw that video, I thought, okay, there's a whole different uh, uh, a field of expertise that needs to be put into this. So over the few months, uh, it was our daughter who did the editing of the videos for us initially up until probably... Thanks, Laura. Up until probably the last couple of weeks. And for this Jaeger video, um, I finally got my act together with the iMovie and I'm very into uh, the, the, the uh, 
the backdrop. I'm very into the spacing and all that stuff. And now I've learned how to do that video editing myself. Larry's the one who does the recording on GarageBand. And again, this is a work in progress and it's actually really, really fun to figure this stuff out and to put out a product that um, is improving every time we do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we keep you busy at the HPO, right? Asking for these uh, <laughs> home, home engagements. Um, just another couple of comments here. Michael Fedishian comments, Mary makes us all sound good. Oh, how lovely. <laughs> And uh, yeah, <laughs> and uh, Erica uh, Rutledge comments, uh, put me down for the album pre-order. There you go. <laughs> you got another, another uh, project to do, uh, the three of you. Um, all right, just uh, one, one more question before we bring in a video question from one of our composer fellows is, uh, Mary and Larry, have you ever had any other works written specifically for the two of you? Uh, early on, maybe five years ago, I have a friend and composer friend named Don Sweet, and he wrote trumpet duos for myself and another colleague, Holly, and because during shows, when we had intermission, we would go practice and play duets, and so he was inspired by that, and so Larry and I got a copy of those and we actually recorded those for him for his birthday two or three years ago. Mm -hmm. And so not specifically to Larry and me, but to me and another trumpet playing co colleague. And I was thinking, okay, that might be our next video project to get those up and running right. too. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, we'll check in with you later. Um, all right, so now let's have a video question submitted by our HPO composer, Matthias McIntyre. My name is Matthias McIntyre, and I'm a composer fellow for the Hamilton Philharmonic Orchestra this season. My first couple questions are for both David Yeager and our trumpeters, Mary J and Larry Larson. As a string player composer, I'm always interested in learning about the capabilities of other kinds of instruments, especially winds and brass. What should a composer keep in mind when writing for the trumpet? And also, what do you love about the trumpet? And I'm interested in both the composer's and the performer's perspective. My second question is for David Yeager. Along with Two New Hours, another part of your amazing work with CBC Radio was in developing emerging Canadian composers through endeavors such as the CBC Radio Canada National Competition for Young Composers. Can you talk about the importance of public radio in promoting new Canadian composers and their music? And as a follow-up, do you think that there is a space to fill in the current Canadian new music landscape? Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Matthias. Those are really rich questions. Uh, so let's start off with the, the first half of that, which is, which is for all of you. Uh, what should a composer keep in mind when writing for trumpet? And what do you love about the trumpet? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. I think the most important thing for composers to know, and this is trumpet as well as every other instrument, is what our realistic capabilities are on the instrument. So often we, you know, I find in performing orchestral music that's brand new world premieres or, or otherwise, is that there are unrealistic demands on the players, not just trumpet, but everybody. So my, my advice to all con composers is to actually sit down and speak with a, a person who plays that instrument and with specific passages even to find out, is this possible? Will this work on my instrument? I've worked with a has been a, a coach with the National Youth Orchestra for 15 years now, and they always commission new compo compositions for orchestra from young composers. And uh, we, as faculty members, sit down with them all the time and say, this works, this works, this does not work, this works. Because I think bottom line is often, as composers, you want your pieces to live. You want them to live past a premiere. And the problem that we've come across often is that pieces are written so difficultly, difficultly for the instruments that uh, they don't get a second performance because first of all, they're, they're perhaps notated poorly. 
or are just beyond, well beyond the capabilities of the instrument. So my, my biggest piece of advice is to sit down with a player uh, and specific writing and say, can you do this? Does this work? What can I do to make this easier notation wise, whether notes themselves or, or even time signatures? Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, Larry. That's, that's great advice and great advice for all of our composers listening. Um, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I, I think, uh, you know, a university has a way of, of pushing composers to explore and, and push boundaries and, you know, explore the unexplorable and then getting out into the real world again and to deal with orchestra where there's, you know, very little rehearsal time and uh, performers with very busy schedules that are doing a lot of different things to make things practical and clear and sound great. Um, so, yeah, great advice. Thank you for that. Uh, Mary, anything to add? Uh, I think you said it to realize that there's very little rehearsal time for these things and and yes make it playable for the instrument and I remember this one specific bar and it was probably two or three years ago and it was an extraordinarily complex uh, uh, group of notes that they were grouped as with a 17 over it with it wasn't a regular pattern. It wasn't like an F major scale. And we, you don't know what the context of these group of notes is, whether it's going to be really exposed or whether it's just going to be in a big mash of sound. And so to something like that, I spent a week learning that one bar. Um, wow. And to me, you know, then it ended up, it was in just this loud mash. I just kind of went, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so basically the answer is that just make it playable, make it as clear as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's uh, your story there brings about the idea of having respect for the performers, um, which, yeah, and enough said. Uh, David, do you have anything to well, add to that? I, yeah, I think it's uh, the case uh, always to be mindful of when writing for whether it's trumpet or any wind instrument is obviously they have to breathe. <laughs> and it's funny, you know, oftentimes I've heard from the podium, you know, a conductor trying to get the orchestra to have that feeling, that sense that the music breathes. Because the sustaining instruments can go on forever. But for wind instruments, take advantage of in your in your in your phrase structure, take advantage of phrase lengths that allow them to breathe. I know there are tricks where you can you can grab breaths, to, you know, while you're playing, and there's circular breathing, and there's lots of lots of technical tricks that you can do. But I think that's the most important uh, essence to be mindful of with with wind music. But also, I would say with the trumpet in particular, the trumpet has a number of different registers, and Sonically, it's different, whether it's in the very top register, where it can be absolutely piercing, uh, the, the bottom register, where it's big and full, and in between, you know, um, and all those different areas of the, of the trumpet reg, uh, registers, they sound different. There, there are nuances that you can take advantage of. So uh, when you're designing uh, your, your, whether it's your, your melodies or in the case of ensemble writing, you know, combining the, the, the voices. Uh, this is something that you can get all kinds of different effects from depending on what register you, you choose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th thanks for that. Um, and now the, uh, the second part of that question, what do you love about the trumpet? Uh, for me, David sort of uh, talked about it a little bit it's when you play those two notes together uh, and when you get the perfect harmony and when you get those wavelengths. And you had a term for it, David, that I loved. I hadn't heard sort of that term. We call it sort of like when the harmonics start, we call it, they kind of, you can feel this sort of, you can kind of feel this sort of grinding when these harmonics, um, and it's- They're called different tones. Yeah, yeah, and for me, when you play with players that you can create that sort of effect. To me, that's the magic of playing trumpet and playing 
two trumpet stuff. And obviously the sound is amazing. <laughs> you know, I like, uh, oh, sorry, Larry, go ahead. I, that I, th I think David's point about the different registers in which we play and the different emotions that we can get out of those registers is what really gets it for me. I mean, I love playing the high piercing stuff, but also, you know, if you can play a, a nice full low melody, uh, I play a lot of songs, a lot of vocal music, just just in my daily practice, just because I like to have that idea that we're we're just singing through lines, whether it's top or bottom of the range. So that's it's all singing. Mm hmm. Yeah. Good advice too. Treat the trumpet like a lyrical instrument, like the lyrical instrument it is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, David, uh, anything for you? No, I'll just underscore what Larry just said. You know, it's a it's a, a melody instrument. And, and you should sing. And it's, it's, especially because it has dynamic power. I mean, you can, you can sing to the world, as it were, you know, sing to the whole hall. Uh, it's, uh, it's a beautiful instrument in that it, uh, it, it, it just, it can, it can be the whole deal. It can just be a wonderful thing, just in the, the pure sound of it, and and the projection of a of a beautiful melody. I remember when the uh, the oboist Heinz Holliger uh, was recording with me once. He said, he says, you know, I don't want to sound like an oboe. I want to sound like a soprano or a violin or, you know, his idea was that you know that in the world of melody. Um, you just want it to be beautiful and you don't want the instrument itself to be the, you know, what it's about. It's getting the melody to, to get across and, and, and to be enjoyed by the listener. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I wrote, uh, well, I've written a few things for our principal trumpet, uh, Michael Fedition, and, and one of them was, uh, a concerto of sorts. It was a, a duet for trumpet and soprano uh, featuring Stacey Dunlop. So that was really fun to, to really explore yeah. that as the partner for the soprano. Um, so Matthias uh, comments, thank you, Mary, Larry, and David. These are all great tips. I'll have to send you my trumpet parts. There we okay. go. <laughs> uh, Matthias is writing a new piece for our concerts uh, in May. And now, uh, David, there was a second part of uh, Matthias's question for you. Uh, can you talk about the importance of public radio in promoting new Canadian composers? And yeah. do you think there is a space to fill in the current Canadian new music landscape? Yes, for sure, for sure. I mean, uh, I have for my entire life been a, a, a great believer in the power of public radio. And especially in, as it's practiced in Canada, you know, where the, an act of parliament, you know, the Broadcasting Act created public radio. And um, what, it, what it functions like in Canada is as, as network. It's not just that it's public, but it's, it's a national network. And so we're speaking to the whole nation when we're broadcasting on the CBC. And for, for people in, in interested in new music, for example, having the chance for the whole nation to hear what's going on, what, what, um, what are the new voices coming forward? Uh, what are the sort of the highly respected voices doing? You know, what's Murray Schaefer's latest piece sounding like or what, you know, what is uh, 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 Arvo Parrott's latest piece in Estonia. Uh, uh, it's a chance for us all to listen together and to be a community and really to be a nation through our music. And this is something that I, uh, I found enormously valuable. And certainly in, in my role in terms of uh, encouraging the the emerging composers, um, you know, I I think that that what what every composer needs is to be heard, and this is this is certainly true for established composers, but couldn't be you know more relevant to an emerging voice, and because this stuff is not done in isolation, you know, music is made to be shared, and. If, if we can share it as a nation, uh, I think we'll all be enriched 
and will our culture will will develop uh, as a result, especially you know through the diversity of voices that are out there. I mean, I I am a great believer in the the existence of profound talent in Canada. The the people of Canada, the the gifted young people, are incredible in this country. And I've learned this through through experience, just seeing what the act of inviting young composers to, sub, to submit their work, uh, it, what the reaction is and, and the, the, the wonderful miraculous material that has emerged as a result of just asking for it, just saying, yes, we want to hear you. You know, it's it's a very powerful incentive, and um, and it's an incredibly rich uh, source of, of talent. So I mean, and I think you know nowadays we have we have the web, we have internet connections, we uh, we have all <clears throat> all kinds of different ways that we can we can connect. Uh, but for me, network radio is the one way. It's the most efficient way. It's it's the best way. It's the most compelling, the most powerful way to get the whole nation listening all at once. And uh, that's going to add up to a really strong culture. And I must say that you, you mentioned earlier, uh, Abby, uh, when I've taken Canadian music to international audiences, like at the, the International Rostrum of Composers, which I... I did for 25 years as CBC's delegate, and then for six more years as president of the rostrum. Uh, you know, did you discover that there's an enormous curiosity about Canadian music and Canadian culture in the world at large? And you know, because because it's uh, it's such a special thing. It's kind of like um, this abiding curiosity. Like we don't show it enough. We don't, um, it's not sufficiently available. It's still a, a rather a, a big mystery to people in other countries. Like what is Canadian music? What is it really about? Like, how can we, how can we find this? And so, um, yes, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're a nation of, of diverse voices and, uh, uh, there's a fascination in the world about what the heck is going on there. <laughs> and what are these people coming up with that is going to add to to the richness of our musical heritage? Yeah, well, I mean, personally, I, I benefited hugely from this um, because, well, through through CBC and your work, um, I won the, the first uh, Karen Kieser Prize, which was a CBC and University of Toronto Prize. And until that point, I hadn't won anything. I'd submitted and I thought, oh, I'm just, I'm going to have to teach theory. And I was learning to live with that. <laughs> um, and then I won the Kieser Prize. And then uh, you submitted that piece uh, to the uh, International Rostrum of Composers where it won. Um, so that really changed, changed my projection um, and, and, and really started my career, no question. Um, would I have got there? I don't know, perhaps in some way, but, but certainly not to the same degree. So. Um, I personally benefited uh, and, and I'm very grateful. And it's such a shame that we, we don't have that um, possibility anymore for young composers and need to find other, uh, other places for young composers to, um, to access and, and to be engaged in. Uh, so just one, one more question there, part of Matthias's question is, do you think there's a space to fill in the current Canadian new music landscape? No question. I mean, as I said earlier, the one thing a composer needs is to be heard. So uh, we need to we need to find out how how to share this music more effectively. And um, you know, I mean, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of talents working in isolation, uh, and um, uh, for sure, we need to do more. No question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Actually, the funny thing was when when two new hours ended, uh, you know, 
we were actually on the verge of, of a kind of international recognition that uh, was unlike anything our music had ever experienced before. And it was uh, kind of ironic that, that it ended when it did because, uh, uh, you know, we, we were becoming recognized as a significant voice in contemporary music in the world, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, so, th yes, let's keep going. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, we, we had a lot of catching up to do, you know, Canada really joined the new music scene uh, in, <laughs> in the 20th century and, and certainly CBC and your work helped push that along. Um, Matthias uh, writes, thank you for your passion and belief in emerging Canadian composers, David. Uh, now we have uh, one more question from our other HPO composer fellow, Ari, who, who previously wrote, by the way, uh, to your previous response on his question, very interesting and good info for future work. But here is another, uh, another question from Ari. Hi, David. I'm excited to be asking you questions over video format today. Um, now, I'm really interested in the unique perspective that you've been able to have uh, on the Canadian new music world. And I was wondering, how have you seen the ideas in the Canadian new music community change over the time you've been a part of it? And is there anything about the music being written here or the questions being investigated by composers today that have stayed the same since the start of Two New Hours? Thanks. Okay. Well, I was... The first thing that comes to mind is that um, before I joined the CBC, I had finished my, my master's degree in, in composition. And my teacher, John Weinzweig, he was actively discouraging all of his students from writing for the orchestra. He said, it's too expensive. You'll never get rehearsed. You'll never get any rehearsal time. If they can't afford it, you know. And the funny thing was, um, you know, people like that have a, a huge influence on on how emerging composers uh, respond to, uh, to to the field. Well, of course, in the early 1980s, along came Alex Pauk and the Esprit Orchestra. And uh, uh, Esprit Orchestra made a commitment to uh, developing Canadian orchestral music. And... You mentioned Karen Kieser, uh, Abby. Um, Karen Kieser was head of music when this was happening. And I made a pitch to Karen. I said, look, we've got a contemporary music orchestra uh, coming on the scene. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take some more money. We're gonna, we're, we'll want to broadcast these performances. And it's going to make a huge difference to our composers. And God love her. She saw that we were give an extra budget to be able to afford to pay the musicians to do the broadcast of, of this free orchestra. And before you know it, suddenly young composers were just, you know, eager to write for the orchestra. So that, that changed in a matter of, you know, a decade or so. And, um, uh, and now, uh, you know, other orchestras uh, sort of have followed the example uh, the repertoire is growing. There's more music to play. There's there's more curiosity, more interest, and of course the new music festival is a thing now, isn't it? Uh, uh, when Winnipeg Symphony in 1991 established their new music festival, you had you know a great example of a of a fully constituted major symphony orchestra devoting its resources to putting the spotlight on, on new music and new creation. And uh, this like changed the whole attitude across Canada uh, immediately that uh, houses were filled with people, people clamoring to hear these, these new works, to hear these great pieces from around the world. Uh, publishers were telling composers like, like Arvo Pert, there's no question whether you will go to Winnipeg to hear your pieces, you will go, <laughs> you know, uh, not to be overly emphatic, but uh, <laughs> uh, it changed the whole, uh, the, the whole uh, atmosphere around contemporary music and the orchestra. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. and, and then other orchestras followed suit with their own exactly. music festivals, which uh, became quite important. Yeah, exactly. So, so that's something I would, I would say to, to Ari, uh, is that it's great that, that our orchestras now are open to, to this adventure and, yeah. and being, uh, being a resource for, for young composers. Um, Absolutely. And, and we're hoping to, you know, encourage other orchestras to follow what we're doing at the HPO and ha have these mentorship positions for, uh, for emerging composers. Uh, just one more thing I'd like to point out, uh, David, is your, your great article called How to Grow a Composer for Whole Note. Uh, and, and we will post that as well. It's another, another interesting read. Um, now, uh, Larry and Mary, uh, do you have a, a follow-up from your perspective about this question? How have you seen uh, the attitudes towards uh, Canadian music change across your career or, or how it's presented? Well, we at the Kitchener Waterloo Symphony, I know we do at least one commission every year uh, that's presented. And uh, it's so for me, it's been really wonderful to see and hear the work of, of new emerging Canadian composers, uh, as well as, like I said, in working with the National Youth Orchestra, where there are two commissions every year for brand new pieces that are done then on their, on their well, their across Canada and even European tours. So I, I love hearing the voices develop of these new com composers and then finding, uh, you know, which ones stick over the years, right? Which ones really... Uh, grab the ear of the audience and writing, or writing over and over again and, uh, and, and hearing those voices develop. That's been really fun. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, speaking of young voices, we had a question submitted in advance for you two. Uh, this is from Hannah Gordon, who plays trumpet and is in grade 11. Hannah asks, I have a goal to attend university in 2022 for music performance and hope to eventually perform in an orchestra. HPO principal Michael Fedition is my private teacher. Do you have any words of wisdom to share regarding pursuing a career as an orchestra musician? Thank you. Okay, Hannah, um, you're gonna be in really good hands. Um, that would be my first uh, piece of advice is make sure you get a really good teacher who knows what they're doing, who's in the business and who can guide you in the right directions. And of course, Mike will be perfect for that situation. Um, I'm a, I, I don't know where you live specifically, but play every possible way that you can. Play in the youth orchestras, play in your school bands. Um, if uh, Play in church if there is a um, outlet for that for you. Audition, like as I say, the, the Hamilton has a youth orchestra, you have access to the Toronto Youth Orchestra, and the National Youth Orchestra are all really um, crucial programs that, that will get you to that level that you need to have as a professional player. And, um, and also, everything that your school has to offer you, know that you know, it's just the beginning and take what they have to offer you and run with it. Okay. Um, but as I say, Mike will lead you totally in the right direction. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Mary. Um, now uh, a follow up for you, David, from Ari, uh, who says, thank you, David. It's really great to hear more about the trajectory of Canadian music through the years. And our, our final question of the day, uh, David, is for you. This is from me. Um, I'm wondering if you have any stories to share from your time at Two New Hours. I know you recorded many, many live concerts. And uh, yeah, any stories? Well, I have so many stories we could do. We could do a long, long, a long, long time. But um, I mean, you know, the chance to work with Murray Schaefer, you know, whether recording his works on a wilderness lake or his string quartets or his concerto in a surrounded a hall with musicians surrounding the audience, uh, the, the Falcon's trumpet, wonderful uh, trumpet concerto that Larry and I met first over. Um, you know, the chance to meet people like Murray, like Anne Southam, another great Canadian composer to work with them uh, and to meet people like John Cage, you know, was, was really a, a great experience. Uh, 
you know, John Cage, you never, you'd never meet a nicer person than, than John Cage and to admire the, the clarity of his, of his thinking. Uh, I know John Cage said to me once, and this kind of surprised me, you know, here's the father of indeterminacies. And he said, the most important thing to him was this, that the score, that the composer has been as clear as possible about his intentions in the score. And I was wondering about this. What does he mean? Here's, you know, indeterminacy says anything's possible. You know, just let it happen. But the, the important thing that he was stressing was just be sure, be as clear as you can. And the funny thing was he also followed up that, that statement. He said, you know, the score is like a time machine. You know, after the composer's gone, that score will take you to where the composer was and where the composer wanted to go, actually. And uh, it was wonderful to hear this kind of thinking coming from a composer like, like John Cage. <laughs> I don't know. There's okay. just one example. Yeah, <laughs> that's, a, that's a good one. Thanks, David. Um, for uh, Mary and Larry, Eric Larson comments, my heart soars. <laughs> so uh, congratulations to all of you on this wonderful world premiere uh, without words for two trumpets. Thank you for joining me today and happy birthday, Larry. Thank you. Thank you. And can I add one thing, Abby? It's uh, it's been thrilling for me as an outside member of the Hamilton Philharmonic family, just to, to watch these video presentations that you've put together as such a wonderful host in yeah. the way you've crafted each one of these broadcasts over the last many months. I mean, you're just such a, a wonderful spokesperson for the orchestra and uh, an excellent moderator on, on all of these videos. So I thank you. That's, that's very kind, Larry. Thank you very much. Well, to all of you watching, uh, we will have some more of these in the coming months. So stay tuned and uh, we'll see you soon. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.